success. This is the final session, and for me, in some ways, it's the kind of session that the Greens, Greens fundamentally need. Because this is a session where we have three First Nations peoples talking about uh, talking about treaties and sovereignty, discussing um, from a First Nations perspective things that often happen in council meetings, in parliaments um, around the country, and and. As the Greens Aboriginal Justice spokesperson in New South Wales, I see many councillors trying to do the right thing by seeking support <laughs> for the um, statement from the heart, um, encouraging the party along a path to support constitutional recognition. But is this what First Nations peoples want us to be doing? Um, well, the way of finding out the direction we should be taking is surely to be listening to and taking the direction from those First Nations activists who are on the ground um, talking to their community and hopefully becoming a bigger part of our party. Partly through this kind of discussion, and we've got three powerful speakers here today, but also entrenched in our party with a powerful and strong Black Greens movement within our party as well. Um, so we have one apology um, from Linda June Co, who's had to go away to Dubbo for family business, um, and Linda, gives her, Linda June gives her apologies. Um, but uh, Joshua Bell, um, has stepped forward, and I'll give each of the speakers an introduction as they step forward. We're going to hear from Lydia, then Linda, then Josh, and there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers, because our speakers will limit themselves to 10 minutes or less. <laughs> well best. <laughs> Indeed. So can I first of all introduce Lydia Thorpe? Uh, Lydia Thorpe is that kind of politician that Australia needs a bloody lot more of. Um, Lydia is a Gunai Gunjamara woman, and was the first Aboriginal member of the Victorian Parliament. She's a job. <laughs> of all the dumb things Victorians did, not really the media, I'd have to put pretty much at the top of that. Um, uh, Linda's a job or a traditional owner, and, the Vic and as I said, the former Victorian state MP for Northcote. Um, Lydia is one of those Greens members who inspires me in the work I do because her voice is clear, her principles are grounded in community and on country. Um, can you please give Lydia a very strong and warm welcome? Um, okay, it saddens me that Linda can't be here, uh, so I want to acknowledge my sister Linda and the pain that I know her family are going through um, with the loss of her father recently. Um, and also the pain of the Gadigal people of the land that we're all meeting on today, the stolen land that we're meeting on today, and pay my respects to their survivors of attempted genocide, um, assimilation, and the continued injustices that their people face every single minute of every single day. Um, so I just want to pay my respects first and foremost to, to, to my sister Linda Coe, who also walked out with me from the, um, what you know as all the room meeting, but it was actually um, at Yalara. Uh, I also want to, I've got my, I just had my nails done in pink because um, the family of Tanya Day who was killed in police custody, um, uh, family, she had her nails done pink the day that she decided to get on a train and go and spend the day in Melbourne um, and on that way to Melbourne she was incarcerated for being a little bit intoxicated on the train and as a result she was killed um, in prison and that um, that case is starting on Monday morning and we'll be standing in solidarity um, with that family and if you don't know on Friday <clears throat> the Victorian government changed the law to decriminalise public, uh, drunk in a public place as a result of Tanya Day's death and the continued um, pressure that we put on the Victorian government to decriminalise um, people who are drunk in a public place because um, ultimately... 
ultimately it's our most vulnerable people um, that are targeted, and in particular Aboriginal people. And when Aboriginal people are locked up, we all know that uh, we're more likely to be killed in prisons or at the hands of police. Uh, I also need to acknowledge um, my people, uh, Japarang people, who are fighting um, to save sacred trees, 800-year-old um, birthing trees, trees that have been culturally modified over hundreds of years, um, and a landscape that I come from, my matriarchal line, it comes right from that place. And we've maintained a fight there for 14 months, um, camping out. And that fight, um, you know, we've, we've just grown and grown and, and we've got about 200 people on the front line right now waiting to be arrested. So I want to pay my respects to Japarong people. Um, and yeah, I'm here to talk about treaty and um, I think that's, to me, a, a really important way that this country needs to go. I think that's the only way that we are going to unite this nation. I think it's the only way that we are going to solve climate change. I think um, Aboriginal people need to be listened to a lot more by the community and by the Greens. I think that Sometimes we um, seem to be a little bit tokenistic and we're wheeled in um, at the convenience of uh, events and being part of the Black Greens. We're calling that out. We're calling out the white privilege in, within the Greens party uh, because, you know, it's important to have Aboriginal people's voices and positions as part of everything that we do. And we don't support the statement of the heart or from the heart uh, and there's very good reasons why we don't support that and nationally the Greens and I know in certain states and certain councils that a lot of Greens councillors and parliamentarians keep flogging the, the support for this statement that grassroots Aboriginal people across the country don't support. We've not given free informed prior consent, it's against our human rights. So we want to be genuinely listened to and heard, and we want action. The reason why we don't want to go into the Colonial Project's constitution is just that. 230 years ago, we were invaded, and in 1901, they came up with this law of this land over top of the oldest law on the planet. So why would we want to be part <coughs> of a constitution that's denied our rights, oppressed our people, and controlled our lives? I believe, and I know that um, my sister here doesn't agree with, with going down the treaty path, but, and, I, and I respect that, you know, we all have our right to self-determine our own destiny, but I believe that <coughs> we, we live in an unsettled country. There's never been an agreement with the First People. There's never been a negotiation. And I think that through a proper peace treaty, not the state government ones that they're rolling out now, that, that is not a treaty, uh, through a proper internationally scrutinised treaty, we can really negotiate some good outcomes. We can negotiate the closing of, of coal. We can negotiate the protection of our forests and our water. We can negotiate um, some economic empowerment through the, the stolen wealth that's been created from um, an, an illegal invasion and an illegal occupation. So I believe in, in um, a treaty for those reasons. I believe that we can demand um, a Bill of Human Rights. I believe that we can stand together as a nation, a united nation, and call for the end to death in custody. We can call for the end of the removal of our children. We can stand united, and once we get non-Aboriginal people or our, or our allies calling that out, not just us, because we're becoming very few and far between, and it is a struggle. It is a struggle to, to make time to come and 
educate and talk to talk to people. So we want people to take that responsibility themselves and start calling it out. Um, and I'll just end on pay the rent. I think that um, pay the rent is is a concept that we all need to understand and sign up to. It was it came about in the in the 1980s and it's basically to economically empower grassroots Aboriginal people to self-determine their own destiny and, and move away from this welfare dependency and create our own wealth. And if you think about, you know, RMIT University, for example, with 60,000 students, if they all paid $1 a year, that's $60,000 a year that can go to grassroots campaigns so that we are um, empowered and that we have the resources to fight these fights. At the moment, we have nothing. We have nothing but the, the clothes on our back to fight these many, many, many campaigns. And our biggest issue is which priority do we choose today? So thank you. Thanks, Lydia. Um, when you work with First Nations peoples, watching somebody struggling with poverty, fighting off of the department that's taking their kids, fighting to protect their land, and doing it all with strength and resilience, uh, First Nations activists and advocates um, not only deserve our respect, but you think about the systemic injustice just to get to that picket line, just to get to that moment of resistance. They deserve more than our respect. They deserve our alliance and our support and our resources fundamentally. So thanks, Lydia. Um, Gadigal land is, of course, uh, matriarchal uh, land. So starting with both Lydia and Linda is extremely, um, uh, I think it's extremely important. Also, it's, I don't think Josh and I could have arranged anything else anyhow. So, um, uh, but Linda is one of those proud, strong Bomber women um, from the Bridgie clan in the Gunnada area of northwest New South Wales. Uh, Linda spent more than 10 years fighting for land and water uh, against coal and gas companies, um, particularly to protect her local river, the Namoi, um, which is currently being decimated in that ongoing ecological and cultural genocide that's happening on the Murray, uh, Murray Darling Basin. Uh, Linda is a member of FIRE, Fighting in Resistance Equally. She's an active participant in the Vote No campaign opposing constitutional recognition. Please give Linda your ears and respect. Yama, hi everyone. Hope you're all well today. Um, as David mentioned, I'm a Gomorrah woman from the Biritra clan, which is the Gundar area of northwest New South Wales. There's probably a few people in the room today that are familiar with the Moores Creek project uh, and also the Pilliga Gas, lots of people are aware of that, and lately the Shenwa Coal project. Um, so my hometown is completely surrounded now by coal and gas. Um, we're heading on to 15 years of fighting now. Uh, Lydia mentioned, you know, 800 year old birthing trees and that sort of thing. We've lost very similar sites, you know, we've had burial grounds ripped out, uh, women's sites, men's sites, local camp areas, um, significant creation sites. All of those have been decimated or are to be decimated by Shenra, Whitehaven Coal, um, Santos. I think as you get a little bit up over the border into Queensland, you move into QGC and the like. Um, I don't think there's any <coughs> Aboriginal person across our country, anywhere, that has not come up against a fossil fuel company taking every single part of our being. Um, there's not a lot left out there for me to show my children. I think, and I have six children, the youngest of which is just over 12 months. The eldest is 26, and we've managed to have them swing into the river the way we used to, or cruise down it on a tractor tube, you know, right in the rapids, that sort of thing. Um, you know, you can count on one hand how many times my children have experienced those things. That is terrible. 
These are things that every Australian person should be able to do on their local river. Stories they should be able to grow up and take their own kids out there and then their grandkids, you know, like light a campfire and tell a yarn and sing a song around the fire. You're not going to do that on a river with no water. Water, water is a huge issue, not just for Aboriginal people, but for all of us. Without water, what's going to happen to us? These are not Aboriginal issues. These are not black and white issues. These are wrong and right issues. So they come down to every single one of us. Um, to the matter at hand, I guess, about constitutional recognition. Um, as stated already, I'm part of the Vote No campaign. Um, Lydia also has been a participant in that campaign over a number of years now. I wouldn't say I'm opposed to treaty in and of itself, but I'm certainly opposed to treaty the way they're rolling it out today. Um, the farce that is happening in Victoria, um, that I'm sure will continue in Queensland and the Northern Territory, that's not what we want. That is not what any grassroots Aboriginal person that I know has ever wanted. I can tell you now at the Yulara Convention in 2017, there was not a single person from my nation invited that was selected by their people, given a mandate by their people, that was to be taken up there to that convention. To the best of my knowledge, all of those people were government selected. That's, they don't speak for us. They do not speak for us. They never have, they never will. You see these big wigs like Megan Davies and Noel Pearson sitting there and they're mapping out their pretty little pathways that nobody wants. These people are not our leaders. They do not speak for me, they do not speak for mine, and it's against our protocol, our age-old, timeless protocols, as the oldest living nation on the planet, the oldest living peoples in the world. That's not how we do things. So every single one of those people that are out there pushing their little gammon statement, they're not speaking for us. They're not speaking with a mandate from their own people. They are breaking their own law, L-O-R-E, by doing what they're doing. They can't do that. So when you see all these people standing up and they're giving their pretty little speeches and they're waving their pretty little pictures and trotting out some statement with glorious artwork on it, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything because people like me and Lydia and Josh and all the people I speak to every single day, we didn't say, yes, yes, cuz, that's what we want. Yes, sis, please do this for me. Hey, my brother, can you go up here and tell them this is what I want, this is what I need? What is their statement from the heart going to do for my people on the ground? Is it going to put water in my river? Is it going to put food in my belly? Is it going to mean my kangaroos and emus are going to come back and run around in rampant numbers and we'll all be happy and sing songs till the night sky is gone? Like, it's not. It's not ever going to happen that way because as long as these people stand up there, government selected, not clan elected, not one of them was clan elected. One woman went up there from the Gomorrah Nation with permissions and a mandate from 19 elders of our country. She went up there with half a dozen banners painted with the Gomorrah message that I myself painted. That woman was Alice Haynes. She's led the, the Vote No campaign now since 2010. So since the 99, re 99 referendum ended, she has been solid in this cause. In all of that time, I've never heard anybody, except for the likes of Noel and all his little friends, I've never heard a single person say to me, Oh yeah, let's have a rally. We want constitutional recognition. Oh yeah, let's take this statement of the heart out and get all these signatures because, you know, we want the public to understand this is what we want, this is how we're going to get it. We talk about self-determination and the things that we want as peoples going forward. Is 97% of the Australian population voting for what's good for 3% of the population who have had no say? Is that self-determination? Is that creating a solid foundation of a future for my people? Is that a solid foundation for a future going forward in unity for the whole of this country? I'd say that's a big gamble.
Gamble Main Snow. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Linda. It, it's, it's sometimes hard to hear that the solutions that have been peddled are being rejected by grassroots community voices. It, it's hard to hear things you thought maybe were driving things forward on a consensus model are actually being rejected on a grassroots level. But I think we need to hear a lot more of this um, inside the Greens to get a better understanding of what's happening on the ground. And, and when you talk to First Nations people on the ground, as I do a fair bit of, um, they want to talk to you about the fact, well, some data we got last week showed that over the last six years, there have been uh, the better part of 2,000 kids in New South Wales taken from their families and housed in motels or service departments. And having been housed in a motel or a service apartment, some on average for five months at a time, without a family, without a placement, um, at a cost of about 177,000 a pop, um, they say fix that, fix that, and they say stop jailing our people, release them from jail. Those kind of practical on the grounds things, there's no question about unity in the Aboriginal community on, and why aren't we concentrating on those things where there's unity and clear and fundamental unity first? But anyway. Um, our third speaker is Josh Bell. Josh has stepped up and I'm grateful for him and we're all grateful for him. Um, Josh is a proud father of the Gomorrah and Ngunnawal Nations. Um, um, and we've got two speakers from Gomorrah today. Um, one of the largest and proudest nations, First Nations peoples um, in, in New South Wales. But we did want to have a Wiradjuri voice too, which would have given us a nice balance. But um, uh, can you please welcome Josh um, and particularly thank him for stepping up and giving his perspective. Yeah, I'm, uh, first of all, I pay respects to the Gadigal Nation, which we're all gathering on today, the elders past and present. And um, my name is uh, Joshua Bell, but um, my real name is Bare Bamba Gulbi, and that name has been gifted to me by a warrior of our nation, who would be sitting here today had his <laughs> voice not been silenced and, and whatnot. So that's part of the decolonising process that we're doing as First Nations people is taking back our identity. I don't identify with being Aboriginal, I identify being Gomoro and Ngunnawa. So with the treaty thing, you know, it's very interesting. Like, it's, um, it, you can't sort of do a treaty for the whole entire nation when every single nation is different, you know? So it's very complex and very tricky and that's the way that these, these um, you know, this corporation that's masquerading, you know, have, have created that you know, to keep it complex and to keep us going round and round and round, you know, and, you know, Australia's just like an onion, you know, you peel one layer back and there's another one, and it's another one, and it's, you know, it's like 250 years of injustice and oppression and, um, you know, that divide, and I won't say conquer, because they never will conquer us, you know. Yeah. We, um, we don't own the land, the land owns us. When we look after the land, it looks after us, you know, and, you know, Australia's just like that perfect egg from the outside world, you know, and it's um, rotten to the core on the inside, you know, and it's um, the, the stench of 250 years of, of that oppression and injustice, it's really reeking um, every day, but I am filled with hope, you know, hope seeing all you people here today listening to us, um, and, you know, that, that patriarchal system has to really be broken apart and smashed apart like literally because what is it like the one percent of the world you know it's not you know and my biggest fear as a father is is my son's not being able to go to just get a drink of water from the tap you know and right now up in Gomorrah country and um my mob can't even go and do that you know so it's it's heartbreaking but it also that that heartbreak turns into you turn that into fuel you know because we come from love and honor and integrity over a hundred thousand years you know, looking after one another, making sure everyone had a feed, everyone had a say, everyone contributed to our circle. We circle people. We don't have all the, not one person has all the skill sets, um, but we all do have a skill that we can contribute to the circle to keep it strong and... Um, continual. Continual, yeah, thanks, sis. You know, pretty nervous. I come in as a guest, because um, <laughs> um, I'm very proud being raised by my mum from that matriarchal um, system that we, we have. 
Um, and, you know, I was looking for, and I didn't you know. give him a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so when they pull rank, you know, that we've got to listen. And that's why you know, a lot of our mob need to understand as well is that, that matriarchal way and, you know, respecting our, our women and our way of life and our law. You know, there's a lot of law being broken. And, um, you know, I, I have lots of, lots of, lots of hope uh, despite the ugliness of the situation. Um, there's a lot of young fellows out there that are awake now, you know, and aware of this situation. Um, we've got to somehow try to shift the, you know, the action from, from Facebook and that to real life action. You know, hit the streets as, as Mao, as one, you know, walk with us, ask the questions directly. You know, I'll, if I haven't got the answer, I'll ring an uncle, I'll ring an or I'll ring someone. Someone will have the answer, you know, and, um, you know, I'm very, very thankful to, to be here and pass on my perspective, I guess. But it, it is, you know, the whole land's hurting. And when that hurts, we hurt. Um, we just got to keep fighting the right fight, and that's with love, you know. Yeah, well, Everything yeah. is all around love, um, the love of life. The simple, we're simple people, you know. Like you're talking about pay the rent and, and all that, like, like that, that will help in an economic situation, um, like developing a more economic base. There's a lot of indigenous business out there now, um, running programs and really making a difference within the whole nation, you know. Um, you know, I don't want no money. I just want my rivers to be left alone and they're destroyed up home. And, you know, they're going for the other rivers now down in Murrumbidgee. That's my other nation down that way. You know, down Canberra, Yasway, headed for the Griffith food, the food bowl down that way. You know, the Sydney siders think that they're, like, you know, safe from all this. You know, just at the back here, Warranora Dam and Illawarra and all that. Man. They're bubbling, you know, chemical from the long wall mining and the fracking. You know, it comes back to that onion. You know, we've got the deaths in custody. We've got the water. The man, it's just layers upon layers. But if we use the right fuel, you know, our old ways, um, sacred ways, you know, we've all got access to, you know, each, every um, First Nations people have them answers, like can go back to their old ways and to decolonize from the, 200 years of, of, um, of lies and, you know, that division and, um, you know, the rivers are the heart and soul of our nation, you know, no water, no life, it's simple as that. It ain't black and white, it's a human issue, you know, it's a humanity issue and it's happening worldwide. Um, so we've got to keep banging on the door, you know, unite as Mao, as one, and continually to put pressure on those in the positions of power and, um, make a change and really listen to our youth, you know, our youth, these climate change youth, I remember that first little rally when I seen the cl climate kids going for it, I cried, you know, and I'm a man that, like, I am proud, I'm, I'll teach all my, my sons especially, you know, we live to express, not impress, you know, and um, we unite for the, for what's right for our future, for our kids, and I'd like to thank you all that are here today, and, um, yeah, um, I'd really also like to thank the Knit and Nanas, um, I've been on two, two, <laughs> yeah, well, bit um, I've been up to the Pilliga twice now, and um, yeah, um, met with the crew out there in Sydney a few weeks back, and had a yarn out there with them, so I'd like to thank those fellas, and the fire crew, you know, fighting in resistance equally, you know, when I seen that, that's that fuel, that hope, that, you know, um, so I'd like to thank fire as well. Um, and war, and, you know, there's many other groups out there, you know, fight for what's right. Um, here in Sydney, we've had a, a group of uni students, um, you know, from all walks of life, you know. Um, I'm a proud skateboarder, see, you know, and probably a bit off topic, but it's like us skaters, we united back in the day when, you know, from broken homes, different cultural backgrounds, didn't matter, we formed our own little circle. It was us against the world, you know. And now, you know, that corporate side of things is coming in as well to that side of it, but that opened my eyes to that one love approach and to treat people how I want to be treated. And you never do something to someone that you don't want done to yourself, you know. And, you know, everyone in Sydney needs to be aware of what's going on here as well. Um, they think we're free from it, but it's going to happen here as well soon, and unless we keep doing what we're doing and with forums like these. And, yeah, um, just like to say Gabby Endo, that's thank you. Cheers.
Look, can we again thank Lydia, Linda and Josh for stepping up. Well, we can have a couple of microphone moments, hopefully, and I'll take some questions. But as people are thinking about their first questions, I might just throw the first thing to Lydia. Given, well, Lydia, Linda and Josh to answer, um, given what's happened in Victoria, that movement around treaty in Victoria, what are the immediate thoughts and lessons from the Victorian government model that we should be thinking about before we step down that path in New South Wales? Um, well, I think you've heard um, it beautifully put by a brother here about no one goes hungry. You know, no one, in, in our way, it is a circle and no one gets left behind. Uh, the Victorian Treaty model does just that. We have around 38 nations in Victoria uh, and they have given 11 reserved seats to the corporations. So that's a very bad start. Um, you also heard how we determine in our own clans and nations who our spokespersons are, who our, we know who our elders are, we know who our troublemakers are, we know, you know who our spokespeople people are. Just like you all know who those people are in your families. We know that too, it's actually um, proven and um, survived thousands and thousands of generations. Yet, the Victorian government, through the Treaty Commissioner, they, they chose who their Treaty Commissioner was, um, who has a bureaucratic background. They chose to go with 11 reserved seats. Now, those 11 reserved seats have been formally recognised by the government and they are the ones that sign off on all the deals. They are the ones that purport to represent the people. They are the ones that signed off on the Japaran trees without consent of the people. So this, so, so the 11 reserved seats you have and then to fill the remainder of seats, 21 seats, They've come up with the idea of having an Aboriginal role and to be a member of the Aboriginal role you have to enrol to vote on to that role. And then those that choose to become a candidate, we have to go and appeal to our people to vote for us. I've, I've just put my hand up um, to be a candidate in the Assembly, but if those trees go, so will I because we can't have a treaty with no trees. Um, so I think, yeah, the Victorian model, and I, and I know that this, the Queensland Government are going down exactly the same path. I know that the Treaty Commissioner has been to Queensland talking about how wonderful the Victorian model is, and I know she's done the same in the Northern Territory. Uh, so it is about um, going with the recognised groups, so the groups that do, do deals with Adani and the groups that do, do deals with these mining companies, they are the groups that they are talking to and they, they are disempowering the people that want to have a say, but they're disempowering the people who are struggling to survive. These are the people who are hungry, these are the people who are having, having their children taken away. David talked about 2,000 in New South Wales. Well, we're 2,500 in Victoria, stolen children. Sure. We have over, we have an increase of over 400% of Aboriginal women incarcerated in Victoria. Over 400%. How can we go with a smile on our face and talk about treaty with the Victorian government when they're doing that to our people and our land. So, unfortunately, and I really was excited about treaty in Victoria, they came out with a map of all the Crown land that was left, and they said, this could be yours in the treaty process. And we thought, yeah, this is great, you know. Um, but, you know, that was three years ago, and they are selling it off so fast that by the time we get to negotiate, there will be nothing left. 
So it is hard and it's a battle, but we need, you know, we need everybody to get on board with this because we can have a good treaty process, but it, it cannot leave anyone behind. It cannot um, dismiss any clan or nation because they know who their people are and they have a right to be at the table. Yeah. Hello. Um, hi, thanks so much for um, speaking. I really enjoyed hearing what you um, guys have to say. My name is Ashwin. Um, this is obviously a huge question and can't fully be answered, but I would just like to hear um, some thoughts on it, um, quick one. So um, I am a settler on Mura Oradio land. My family came from India um, and took up being part of the colonial project in 1991. Um, my grandmother was alive and was very um, excited to see in, um, in India what happened when the Indian people demanded freedom and British India fucked off and British India was abolished and that land was handed back to Indian people and colonisation ended. Obviously, it's a very different question because the British weren't there to take the land, they were only there to take the money, so they didn't commit the same amount of genocides. Um, so, for me and for so many people, I think that the decolonisation of this land um, and effectively the abolition of colonial Australia is, is a very important justice imperative, um, but more Importantly, I'm seeing it as a survival imperative. We saw what happened to the Amazon rainforest. We know that climate climate change is basically fucking locked in. We know what that means. We know that places where food grew, food's no longer going to grow. Um, we know that the water's going to dry up. We know all of this shit. And we know, honestly, historically, the only way we're ever going to get through this is by um, Aboriginal land management, by the ecosystem, um, knowledge and the ways that Aboriginal people have been living on this land have survived climate change of different types for thousands and thousands of years and if we're going to survive this as a society we need to abolish colonial Australia and hand the land back to Aboriginal government systems otherwise we're all just going to die so I'm just wondering what kind of um, discussions people are having in the Aboriginal justice movements about decolonisation and what that kind of looks like what the sort of, I mean, obviously it's not a settled question, and I know those are massive ongoing discussions, but I'm really interested to hear what kind of discussions people are having and how um, settler activists and settler movements can support that sort of process from the outside to kind of have a unified project um, about decolonisation, because, you know, we've got to do it in the next 10 years, we're all dead. Thank you. We might take a couple of questions to kick it off and go to the panel. Yep, later there. Oh, very good evening. Thank you so much for your talk. And uh, I belong to the Reconciliation Network, and we have supported the Uluru Statement very, very strongly. Uh, we were asked to do so, and many, many councils in Sydney have supported the Uluru Statement. In fact, my group is going to meet on Tuesday, and I have, for example, my council has supported the Uluru Statement. You mentioned something before, Lydia. Would you care to tell us again why you don't support the Uluru Statement? So can we do that? Thank you um, for, first of all, recognising the land that you live on as well. You know, it's very important. There is many different nations here in Australia, you know, and it's good to be aware, you know, so thanks, Bruce. Um, it could be, you know, from a personal perspective, um, I embrace the old ways in terms of our yuku yupaji, our song and dance, um, and that really, yeah, fired me up on the inside and um, made me realise just how powerful and proud we are, um, but that's not to say that every Aborig Aboriginal person has to jump up and do crobbery, you know, jump up and shake leg, <laughs> alright? There is many different ways and that it could be as simple as the diet, you know, just getting away from the fast food, eating nuts and berries and, you know, water and your health, you know, um, that's one way I guess. Um, yeah, and just constantly asking questions, those and breaking those systems down that we've all, you know, um, been a part of, I guess, like, um, you know, I had, had one of my cousins ring me up crying, you know, he's like, bro, I wish I was a cultural man, I wish I was, like, up there dancing and, and all that. I said, Brent, you're a proud father. You get up every day, you go to work, you know, you're, you're proud of yourself. It starts with one mouth and then it ripple effects out, you know. So every day he goes to work, provides for his family, 
etc etc you know that's um i guess it's like because we float the two worlds you know in, in and out we obviously need money to survive um pay rent we're owed rent <laughs> and you know both yeah we need to survive so we're constantly floating in and out of that world and um being aware that we float is a good way as well to understand that um you know, we can't just stay in that, that, that one space all the time. Um, from a cultural perspective, I guess, through some of the lessons I've been taught, you'll go womba, you'll go mad if you try to stay, you know, in that space all the time, you know. So, yeah, it's many different ways and um, getting back to that simple way of living and, like, for me, gardening, you know, that really helped me. And, but, yeah, I want to use one to touch on that. Where does the D come one of the questions, that, there's a number of that question was, where does the decolonising project take us? I mean, what's the end goal for the decolonising project? Mm. Sorry, what was that? What are the like, decolonisation has a lot of different yeah, ideas. Um, and what are the kind of discussions that people are talking about right now? Because I know it's quite contested among various other activists and where the debates and how can we support those debates happening? Mm. Okay, well... I mean, okay, so decolonising can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, as you pretty much just said. For me, personally, it all starts with respect. So, I have respect for you, you have respect for me, and somehow or other we find a middle ground that works for both of us. Now, if somewhere along the line, what you want does harm to myself or any other person, that's not going to work, and vice versa. So the end game, the end game is obviously a unified nation. You know, obviously, you know, the Australian people aren't all going to jump on a leaky boat and go home. So we have to find a way to go forward together. That's not going to happen when we have things like the statement from the heart being shoved down the throats of everybody and they're saying that's acceptable. Um, you know, we have... As Lydia said, we were talking about what's it, 400% of women being incarcerated in Victoria. Women, our women being incarcerated are among the highest rising numbers today. How, how do you have a society without women? You know, because I'm sorry, okay, like, we make the laws, men uphold them. That's how it worked. Um, because we carry the creation. We are, you know, we are all the things that sustain life. Men allow that to happen. They make that happen by upholding those matriarchal, you know, ideas or realisations that we have always had. Um, you don't see men walking around having babies, do you? <laughs> you know, it all sort of starts with us. So for me, it's everything has to start with respect. And I think that's a key thing of the latest, um, you know, like with constitutional recognition, you hear a lot of catchphrase, like, you know, we've had over the years, you know, um, native title is not land rights, those sorts of things. Well, recognition is not respect. I've heard many politicians say that, um, you know, like, include us in the constitution and that will start the healing process. We will have reconciliation that comes from that and all the rest of it. Well, how long do you play well what? Because we've had 200 plus years now for people to respect us, to reconcile with us, to walk beside us, not to ridicule us and reject us and run us down. And that's what we have today. We are still just, you know, shit on people's shoes. They just, they couldn't care less. They can't wait to get rid of us. Um, you know, I've been to many events where they talk about the statement from the heart. Now, can I just say, I won't call it the Uluru statement from the heart because elders from up there actually asked for it not to be called the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It was taken out, I don't know if anyone watched Q&A, but the Liberal MP Julian Lisa even mentioned that in the report, um, I think Sally Scales was the delegate, and she said that the only two Aboriginal words that were included in the report were, oh sorry, were included when they were talking about the report, what should go into it, were taken out when the report was submitted to the government. Lisa comes back and says, well, only one word was taken out, which was Uluru, and it was taken out at the request of the people from up there. Because they don't want, they didn't want their name 
as a part of that title. So you won't hear anyone on this panel here today refer to the Statement of the Heart as the Uluru Statement, because that would be disrespecting our people up there. And, you know, we do our very best not to do that. The fact that it's been paraded around the country as a document named Uluru Statement from the Heart just goes to show exactly how much respect is being shown to our people today. I don't think you can reconcile around that, can we? Uh, just on the decolonising, I think what you see at the Japarung trees is decolonising, it's taking our land back and it's not um, recognising or acknowledging the, the state violence that c continues to be perpetrated against our people and our land. I think um, that is a, a beautiful way that allies can come together with traditional owners and save sacred landscape and trees in a way, in a decolonising way, because the, the things that are happening at that, at that beautiful place are things that I can't even describe um, in terms of traditional owners and, and allies coming together and sharing stories and, you know, non-Aboriginal women, pregnant women going to that area and having a, just incredible experiences with their unborn child. These are non-Aboriginal women. So it just shows what hope there is, you know, for us to unite in a way that respects land and culture and each other. Um, I think that, you know, we can decolonise in a way that questions the colonisers um, and looks at our law and, and upholds our law that's been maintained and survived 230 or 50, I, I always lose track of how long it's been, too long. Um, too long. <laughs> um, but you know, I think it's about upholding the traditional law system of this land, which everyone will benefit from, everybody can be a part of, um, because it's not something that, you know, we are exclusive about, it's something that we want to share to um, make the world a better place. Uh, and there's all sorts of other um, examples. There's a group that I work very closely with called Allies Decolonising, and they educate non-Aboriginal people a lot for me because I'm exhausted. And so I can just tell a lot of non-Aboriginal people when they come to, to know about things, actually there's a group of non-Aboriginal people that can tell you that because they've gone and learnt themselves and they've respected how burnt out we're becoming and that they are actually doing an amazing job. Um, and there's other things, you know, we're, we're decolonising by using language. Let's change all the street names. Let's, let's make people speak our language, the law, the language of that land. That's another way to decolonise. There's so many ways that we can decolonise. Um, on the... Um, the statement from the heart. Yes, I, I know that there are a lot of reconciliation groups across this country that are supporting it. My mother was on the original council for Aboriginal reconciliation, uh, where the movement first began and where we had a million people. I was one of those people that walked over Sydney Harbour Bridge. In fact, I was pregnant. And I also had dinner with John Howard that night. Oh, lucky you. Um, <laughs> With my, I actually got stranded at his house um, because my my ten year old son wanted his autograph and we had to double back and then when we went to leave there was no bus so we ended up spending some time with Janet um, and I had my little sister with me and she was about twelve and you know we were meant to be good little black fellas on the bus going to the house and uh, with my mum and I kind of threatened my little sister and said do not say anything about saying sorry just just behave yourself <laughs> and she's one of the founding members of war as a 30 year old um, and that's the first thing she said to him when we rocked up at his house why won't you say sorry to my people <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know, that was the biggest consultation this country's ever seen with its first people. Uh, it was a, an exhaustive 
consultation that went out to clans, went out to nations, talked about reconciliation, spoke to non-Aboriginal people, and the end result that was that this country is too racist to reconcile. But what it did do is it looked at what the priorities are for Aboriginal people at that time, and it was treaty. It wasn't constitutional recognition. And in the last 20 years, reconciliation has become corporatised. They went from the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation to Reconciliation Australia. They do business with companies. They do business with mining companies and they go along and they say, can you please do a reconciliation action plan and can you please fly the flag? Well, you destroy the people's country, but fly the flag and employ some white fellas because that's just the right thing to do while you destroy their land. So there are good people involved in the reconciliation movement, but they've gone, they've completely lost the plot and going down a very bad track. When you have the likes of Whitehaven and San, uh, BHP supporting the statement from the heart, um, doesn't that actually make you nervous that we have mining companies supporting this statement? The statement is going to completely assimilate us as first people of this land. You look at um, what they now call um, Ken Wyatt. <laughs> Have you ever heard of an Aboriginal um, portfolio holder within a government being called Indigenous Australians Minister for, or the Minister for Indigenous Australians? <laughs> that slipped in. No one realises, but that's what they want to make us. They want to make us nice little neat and tidy Indigenous Australians, put us in the Constitution, completely assimilate us and finish the rest of the colonial project. And that's not, we're not going to allow that to happen. We want a treaty, we want it properly um, scrutinised in a way that all of our clans and nations decide. If you look at the Waitangi Treaty, it's not, it's not great, no treaty's been great and they've all been broken. But clans and nations had an opportunity to self-determine whether they want to participate in the treaty. And I'm sure there's clans and nations that don't want to participate. But that's their choice. And I think that's what we need to be doing. We need to, we need to um, demand that a comprehensive consultation, like the one that happened 20 years ago, happens again and ask the people what they want. The, the meeting at Yalara, uh, the people that spoke out against what was going on or questioned what was going on and questioned the constitutional lawyers how going into the Australian constitution was going to affect our sovereignty, they wouldn't answer that. They came up with excuses of it's up to interpretation of the law. But does that mean we've got to trust the interpretation of the law? That's not something I'm going to risk as a sovereign black woman. So, because we did question it, myself and my little sister and a, a few other women um, were threatened with tribal punishment because we spoke out. Yep, tribal punishment. We, we weren't allowed back to our hotel rooms that night and we had to sleep in the desert with no blankets, absolutely terrified for our lives. Even talking about it um, brings back the trauma that happened to, m to myself that night and my sister. So we were set up, and yes, it was invitation only. They know this is one thing that the government have worked out over, you know, over the time of invasion is they know how to divide us. It's the, it's the art of war. They know how to invite only the people that are going to say yes and the ones that say no they're we're the ones that are poor and sick and struggling to continue that fight that's why you don't hear about it we asked to go on q a to give our perspective and we were denied our voice there we had a young fella in the audience who also walked out with us that, that questioned it but we don't have the money that the statement from the heart do to go around the country and talk to people. The, the statement from the heart began with a with a, um, a thing called You Me Unity. 
Millions of dollars went into that campaign. Then that, that didn't work. People, blackfellas didn't want that. So then they came out with a recognised campaign. More millions and millions and millions of dollars went into that campaign. And they realised, OK, that no one wants that either. So then they dressed it up and made it look pretty. And they put some beautiful words in that statement, don't get me wrong. They have made it look very appealing, especially to white fellas. White fellas like, you know, we want to support, we want to support the Aboriginal people. This looks good, this feels good, no one's opposing it, so let's support it. And I, and I cringe when I see some of the organisations uh, supporting it. I think, really? You haven't spoken to the people. So if, if we're given or afforded the opportunity to run a campaign, and yes, we do, we do need resources to do that, um, then you will hear us. I'm trying to get a documentary uh, made on the walkout group so that people can actually learn the true truth of what happened there. Even that's a struggle. We have run out of time. I'm sure there's a whole bunch more questions on the floor, but I reckon if I go beyond, Antico will um, evict me from the party room. Um, can I ask you to, uh, first of all, do a big thank you to Lydia and Linda and Josh. Um, just wanted to really touch on that treaty stuff as well. Um, it's very tricky. I spoke to a few of my brothers about this a few times. And I personally, I'd like to see each nation within New South Wales have our own elections. And the people, the clan, we could select a man, a woman and a youth to represent that nation, all voted in by the people. Because a lot of our people won't vote. They don't want nothing to do with the system. And it's understandable why, you know. Um, some do vote, I vote. Um, but some won't. I hope you vote green. Yeah, I will, of course. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I'd like, for that treaty, like, you know, we could have our own elections, form a First Nations party that could tackle this two-party preferred system that they do, that they use, and, um, you know, it's just an idea, and I thought I'd float it out there now and see what sort of, um, how we can move forward with that as well, because there is a lot of strong, wise people within each and every nation. And that could form, so they represent each treaty. There's not one big treaty, like for the whole country. It's, yeah, it's pretty complex. Just quickly, um, the last thing I want to say is regarding their voice to parliament. Well, this parliament has no ears. <laughs> has there ever been a parliament with ears when it comes to our people? If we're going to go to all the trouble, this is the question I submitted to Q&A and it was refused. I'll also say that we put in for some people from the vote no to constitutional reform. We asked for them to be some panellists and that was refused also. But the question I submitted was, why are we going to all the trouble and expense of a referendum only to ask that a voice be enshrined to parliament rather than rights for our people? It seems to me like a lot of money a lot of time, a lot of effort, for a whole lot of nothing. You get a few cushy jobs out of it for the likes of, you know, Jacinta Price and that kind of people. They're not our people. They're not our people at all. So, why? You know? Enshrine rights for our people. A voice to a parliament with no ears won't get us heard. <laughs> You can never stop black fellas from talking. <laughs> so. um, I just wanted to also add that um, we don't need to go to a referendum to have a treaty. You know, we don't need to spend the, the, our money to go to a, a referendum that no one wants. Uh, we can have a treaty without a referendum. The other thing is, and um, you know, the, the only kind of Barnaby Joyce came out with an idea of having um, Senate spots for Aboriginal people within each state. Well, I actually like that idea. We don't need a voice to parliament. If we had Senate spots just for black fellas, 
then we decide on who those people are rather than the parliament or, those, or the bureaucrats deciding who the voice to parliament is. So I think we need to explore that idea and maybe that's the way we go down um, because that will guarantee Aboriginal people from each of those states and territories a seat at the table. Um, well, thanks again. When the Black Greens come to our party and ask for resources and respect, there'd be a really good answer to that request, which would be yes, we'll give you resources and respect to the Black Greens when they come to our party. Um, we'll be in and, touch. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go out and launch ourselves on treaty process, this kind of discussion and this kind of partnership is got to be, has got to be the fundamental starting point before we do a media release or a cunning plan about Aboriginal empowerment. Mm. Because if you respect sovereignty and you respect the complexity and the richness of First Nations and each and every First Nation in this country, surely that's the kind of complex understanding the Greens need to get to. If you understand that complexity, the different voices, the different consensus decision-making models um, of First Nations peoples in this country, once we get our head around that, then we can walk together in partnership and start talking about treaties. But I think today's been particularly enlightening for me. I hope it's been enlightening for you in the audience. I know there's been some hard things to look at. Things we've shared on Facebook, things we've signed up to, things we've pushed our local council or reconciliation group. But unless we're gonna be honest and have that honest reflection on who we're standing with and what voices we're listening to, we're not gonna be advancing the project for First Nations justice. So again, with that, can we thank all the three speakers and thank everyone for leaving.